Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Pinewood Homeschool Masterclass. Tonight's guest is James Gao, uh, no stranger to the design scene. Um, he's been with us for quite some time. Uh, James, could you give us a little bit of a history for your design? Um, well, I started teaching marching band right around 2009 when I was still marching in drum corps. It was a way to help pay for college and stuff, you know, instead of just working at the Jamba Juice, which was the other option. Um, and then I was just teaching a group that, you know, cycling through drill riders every year, every other year. And I decided, you know, why not just try my hand on it? And that was a uh, 2011 was my first year and I was riding with Pyro then. So yeah, I guess we're going, coming up close to a decade. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about that organic design. Oh, cool. So yeah. Um, I mean, I, I marched blue doubles for four years and then top blue doubles for six years. So I learned a lot from, um, people like Jay Murphy um on you know staging by hand and and doing these these things in a way like i you know learning off drill charts that are handwritten um but that's just not a feasible as feasible an option as much anymore especially in the the technology driven world that we're living in so figuring out a way to like make that kind of stuff that happens like on the field and in person with your hands like the things that come up into your head and turning those into pyware software is definitely one of my one of my big goals and one of my favorite things about using the program and about designing for groups across the country is like, how can I make this seem like something that I would have written if I was just driving five minutes down the street like I used right. to do when I was a young, a youngster. <laughs> try to try to make it feel staged, even though you're not able to be there with them. Yeah, yeah. You should. Awesome. Yeah, um, I think one of the big things that takes, I mean, just like any good design, takes a lot of communication, regardless of how you're designing. It takes a lot of good, a lot of communication between you and your your music arrangers and the people who are actually inputting your drill. Right. Um, so I have a lot of really good people who I work with across the country. A lot of my I've been super lucky where um, even <laughs> hi Austin. Um, <laughs> yeah, your Austin's one of them. Austin Green's one of them. But um, yeah, it's really good to have a relationship with people because like at the end of the day, like if I write a thirty-two count phrase where I want them to get from point A to point B, I could write a paragraph. I could write two paragraphs. Right. Um, and other options I could subset it out, but that's just not really that as feasible for the the style of drill that I do as much. But the other, the best option, honestly, is just have a conversation all the time. I like try and be on the phone as much as I can. Right. Uh, do you find yourself doing more video chat just to make sure that you're seeing that they're doing what you're wanting or trying to explain, or is um, it I think mainly on the phone? On the phone mostly, but I think like just like the like how widespread video chat has become in the past. I don't know like a month exactly, uh, right? has made me like kind of open uh, kind of open my eyes on like we could screen share I could use the pointer tool like a lot of things like that would probably be helpful in the future uh, but in the past it's been a lot of um you send me a video I'll watch it I'll take notes and then we'll have a conversation about how to go forward with the parts that aren't working or that maybe aren't implemented exactly how they were in my head so you know kind of a give and take like that but it's been mostly phone but I like the idea of using like a zoom conference or insert your medium here right exactly wonderful uh do you have a couple of example drills for the uh the indoor groups that you've written for yeah so i pulled one up specifically because mm -hmm. um <clears throat> it was probably one of my favorite groups i've been uh like having the experience of doing this they've kind of like put a lot of faith in me they're called downington from um indiana and they're one of the weird groups that they were um i I'm, i know sean's in the group so correct me if i'm wrong here sean but um, they were like a uh, amalgamation of different high schools, like in the same district. But WGI changed the ruling, so we actually were in a Scholastic Open last year, and we're an Independent Open this year. Um, oh, sorry, Pennsylvania, not Indianapolis. <laughs> Might be. Um, but yeah, we we uh, we were we we're doing pretty darn pretty darn good before the you know the whole thing went south. But I, I have a before we got I've, <laughs> yeah. But I've got I've got their um, first movement up, which was essentially the first half of the show that I could talk through. Perfect, that'd be great. And I can screen share that. Yes, sir. By doing that. Sweet. So can we see this? Nope. There it is. Sweet. So, um, just to kind of get started right off the bat. Um, I have a floor covering going on. Uh, this is a floor designed by my friend Kaho, Kaho Kia. And um, these are just some, some standard pyro, pyro marching band uh, costumes, but 
you get the feeling. Right. Um, and so the the show, just like a real quick one, is um these little blue spots are kind of our safe space, and um the the little white props are um they're little they're they're carriers for these boxes. And so say all the members have a box, that box is like their personal information. There's something that's really that they hold dear to themselves and they they hold it within that safe space. And the show's about kind of getting out of your box and opening yourself up to others. Um, the opening of this, which I'm probably just going to play through a bit, is just us standing still for a long time. And I was really lucky to have uh, my friend Tyler Propty. He did a lot of the choreography for this, and he really made this opening sequence. And so this is kind of what I mean about communication. Like, I just let him stand still. I don't know if you guys can see that. That's 56 counts of nobody moving right. from my part, which is great because that allows him to really set the stage from a choreographical sense. Right. Um, so I, this is, we're being clear, kind of the temp track on the music. So if it sounds a little bit off, it's because it's not perfect. Uh, we're not able to hear that music. Oh, perfect then. Good. So what I basically, the way I started this is we have this open spread mm -hmm. and we're going to layer the bass drums as our focal point around into this front left circle. And then everyone else is, um, like I kind of said, in, in like a, almost like a ripple across the whole floor, going back to pick up those props in the back. So okay. we can kind of see that here. Oh, wrong button. Undo. Wrong play button. <laughs> and so, yeah, right here, the bass drums were the focal of the choreography before. Mm -hmm. And as they start following the leader, we start peeling off right here so i have this order written out for tyler and he can do with it what he will and here we set ourselves up for a base feature and everybody's back at their yeah ready to move the props and here's where we enter cool so yeah, like I said, a lot of this stuff is very like base level for when I send it out. And then the conversation happens between me and Sean or me and Tyler or whomever uh, about the way we're layering out. So we have, you know, whoops, we have this guy starting it. And I almost wrote it as a ripple this mm -hmm. way, leading to here. So rippling from the left corner to the right corner. Um, and then once, the whole group enters. We're much more. We're much more set up from that point to be staged, and uh, you know we're setting up our our upper battery here because mm -hmm. they're the main focus. And we'll just let this play through until we get back to here. So again, we'll start at where the prop enters, and then we'll go through where Venus layers up. So base feature finishes out. Everyone enters, mm -hmm. and here's where like actual dot drill happens. Right. We'll go into this after in a second. And a, another layer. And we have a question when you're going into it. Uh, could you explain how you're using the color coding on your count track? Sure. So um, I have red for holds, and then pink usually means hold-ish for me. It means either like something choreographical in nature, or maybe it's a half time, or it's just some sort of version of not straight time or not regular old marching. Mm -hmm. um, and then the color, uh, color coordination from there is, I don't know what it was in this one. It might have been blue was upper battery and green was something else, but it usually it has to do with phrasings. So this whole blue phrase is to get us to the big grouping before we split out to just the upper battery by themselves. So I use the, the groupings either for uh, who's playing or for what, where the phrases start and stop. But red is always hold for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I use them differently for, for marching band than I do for uh, winter drum line. Winter drum line, I have a lot less, I'm a lot, a lot more fluid with it. Right. Um, we also have a couple, a uh, question about the four people in the stands. Is that for, 
printing purposes? Or are they just hanging it, out? It's for printing purposes, honestly. Um, Cause I, you know, you can customize to have the largest printout and you can customize like your zoom options. Right. But if I set these guys here and then I set largest option, mm -hmm. then it's exactly the same size every single time. I actually don't like the, uh, if, if I have it everybody's, if every page is zoomed to largest printout, mm -hmm. I don't like the idea of flipping through my book and every, like say this one is focused on the right side and this one's focused on the left side. I just want my, my, my X, Y axis to be exactly the same on every single page. Right. So I just put those guys and I sit them down and then you actually can't see them. So I don't know how that person noticed at all because they're <laughs> invisible. That's funny. I don't know. Someone did though. It was <laughs> Austin. Of course it was. <laughs> so from here, this is kind of what I, what I've been utilizing a lot. And I'll, I'll go to the regular old view in a second, but you can see these guys are kind of doing a bit of a follow through mm -hmm. rotation and then into lines. And I'll go back to here to show you guys how I did that. So again, lots of arrows, lots of words, um, and either on the phone or not. But we can watch this one just play. Oh, mm. oh shoot. How do I turn this option off, Dustin? The oh, where, it yeah, where it automatically plays. Dang it. <laughs> oh, uh, go to your real view. Open the real view, left or right hand side, there's a button that has a little down arrow. Yep, there we go. And turn that one off. So, what I will do is I will take the, um, each grouping is separated. And then what I'll do is I'll just write a follow the leader. So obviously you can see S2 is the leader here. The, I'll write a follow the leader this direction. And then what I'll do is I'll take the adjuster tool. And because the path is already curved on a follow the leader, right? You just kind of tweak it. I will tweak it to being good math. So the math is correct. Like I have threes here, one, two, three, one, two, three, and then the back one, two, three. Um, so I'll tweak the follow the leader because the pathway is already curved in there. The other option is, oh, good thing I'm saving. Mm -hmm. um, the other option is I could just move these guys, you know, straight line. Right. And then adjust from there. And then, you know, you edit you your path. Your curve path. Yeah. And you make your own curve path. I do that a lot as well. Yeah. Um, I use the adjuster tool probably a hundred percent more in the winter season than I do in the fall season because there's so many fewer members it's a lot easier to adjust yeah. individually or you know in the fall adjust just by section a lot but yeah. um i honestly if you if you watch this whole movement there's a lot of things i start with the fall the leader tool on i mean this is just this one right here is just a simple rotation that i did so i take i took these these outside one two three four five mm -hmm. and i just did a i just did a circle right i just took this guy here and I rotated, and then I adjuster tooled that to fit them to the grid to be an actual grid. And I know I'm messing up, you know what actually used to be, but then All right, but that's a great idea. So, you know, everything starts with motion on the on the when I'm talking about the organic staging like that. Mm -hmm. Everything has to has to start with the motion, and then the dots come secondary. You know, if I was doing this in person, I would say, hey, follow the leader on that dude. And then, okay, cool. Now that, now wherever you ended up, everyone step on the closest grid and then adjust from there. So we still have the curvature of a, of a rounded pathway or a follow the leader, but with right. the added aspect of, you know, it ends linearly. Right, exactly. Well, uh, we had a real quick question on how to get the colors on the count track. Uh, Jason, if you right click on a page tab, you're able to assign a color at the bottom. And that color gets applied to the actual page tab itself. And uh, that normally only shows the color on the page tab. There is an option in your application options. So James, if you could go there right quick. And it's under the track. And then there's going to be a, a show. Let's see, where is it at? Color set range. range. Color set range. And what that's going to do is it's not only going, it's going to take the color from the page tab and it's going to apply it to the count track area. So that gives you a colorized range so you can see that entire duration. 
And uh, we have one other question uh, from Jackson here. Um, how did you become a drill writer? How did you learn to write? And how do you build a client base? And what resources did you find most crucial to your success? Um, I think, well, the, the, to answer the first question, I was a caption head at a small school. Um, and I, you know, it's a two way band in California. And um, it was just, we, we had different drill writers every other year. And it, it, I wasn't making any of the decisions the band director was unhappy or like less than pleased or whatever the answer was. So I just said, Hey, if I said, if you buy me Pyware, I'll do it for free. So I got my, my first drill payment was Pyware. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I forgot what the second question was, but building up a, a clientele, honestly, is just, um, making friends and just being confident enough in the, the stuff that you're putting out that if I see a group and, um, you know, it's one of my friends teaching or say, say like one, one of my friends talks to me, they said they're having troubles with, or they're, they're, they're a little less than pleased with their drill. Um, you know, would I be willing to do it? A lot of that for me was just being confident saying like, yes, I will. Because the first group I ever wrote, it was me teaching it. So I, I would go out and I would teach it and I would say, oh, well, this block at four by four has a very different feel than a block at three by three or a block at four by two. Like the, the, the things that I learned implementing my own drill like made me more confident, but I, I, it took a really big leap of faith for me to like jump into um, doing someone else's drill or she's doing a group that was going to go to like, I don't know, Grand Nationals or something like those things are scary. Um, and he has had the question of how did you learn to write drill? Where did you learn? Did you uh, take courses? Did you? No, I, I guess I'm an autodidact. Um, I, I think Pyware, like, I think I said on the little write up, like Pyware is a, a, a high, a high skill ceiling, mm -hmm. but also like a high skill floor. Like it right. takes a lot of work and the best thing you can do is just start writing. Like yeah. really, really the best thing. And I know like they have a lot of tools now, like the, the, um, the demo that you can download mm -hmm. for free, which is, which is always how I started learning too. Um, but even like the, uh, the user manual the user manual is like really awesome now that it's like all online and searchable and things like that but at the end of the day like just start like find a piece of music go on one of your favorite arrangers you know websites and just start writing wonderful and uh we have the question what what hardware are you running with i'm running an alienware laptop it's an r13 i think it is but it's just a just an Alienware laptop, so it's got lots of juice and um, it weighs way too much for how much I travel around the country. <laughs> I, I've been through a couple of those. I understand that. <laughs> awesome. I really liked what you're doing where you're starting out just kind of getting a general motion and then adjusting yeah. it to, to fit the grid. That's, that's real awesome. Yeah, so if we go back to that. So I like the colors What someone was talking about earlier, the colors, um, I use the colors like for large ranges, like how, what is the idea that happens over a large range of time? And um, this previous one, like from the end of the base feature to where we are all in that, that clump together, that was all just one drill idea where I knew by the end of this, we all had to come together. I knew by here, we all had to be together. And then I knew we layered out into, oh yeah, green is pit in this one, <laughs> sorry. Um, so this is all like a little pit thing, a front ensemble thing, where we are now going to be restaging the props. And I guess we can go over that now. Yeah. So this is, this section here, you know, honestly, if I was looking back, I probably would have made this not the same blue as this one. Um, but this is a little peel out. So it peels out musically where the bass drums and cymbals leave, and it leaves the upper battery. And then right here, so we'll play that part, all the way up until the snare feature. So again, you guys can't hear this, but this is all a layer out musically. And then I put some little visuals in, which if you've ever taught my drill is not something I do a whole lot, but. So again, this is another perfect opportunity for Tyler to like work his choreography magic and he really did. Mm -hmm. And 
And that's the end of that phrase. But if you notice, like right here, we go back to the same um, place where we picked up the cross and forward. That is not how it turned out in the real world because right. like obviously that's an issue. Yeah. Um, if we're doing the same right here and right here are the same, uh, right there, are the same um, pick up and drop off locations, that would be an issue. So that's not actually what we did. Again, I don't know, I didn't check the list fully, but if Tyler's on here, he's a, he's a magician with my work sometimes. And yeah. the big thing we wanted was to go from these separated positions to this big open form. And then we wanted to reposition the props while bringing the snares in. So lots of things happening in a short amount of time. And um, again, like there, there were certain, certain things we needed to happen. Okay, we need to get to a big open form, do a little bit of dancey dance like that. And then we, again, layer it out and bring the snares back in. And we needed uh, a lot of velocity on this last move. Cool. And by the end of this, we have the props in a very different setup than they've been in for the rest of the show. Mm -hmm. They're all along this kind of string that we have going here, this kind of connective tissue that brings the whole floor together. And then we go into a big snare feature. What, uh, on, <clears throat> so when we had Tim on, he uh, said he has a couple of cheats or hints, if you would. Um, he tags that into his actual tarp. Do y'all have a anything that you print on the tarp for um, reference points or is it mainly just the design that you do? I don't know the answer to that question for this particular group because like I said, I don't actually, um, I don't go out there. Uh, we just talk a lot on the phone and stuff. But when I'm teaching my groups and like say, I don't know, not a giveaway trade secrets, but for a broken city or something, we have a five foot by five foot grid printed onto the floor and it's just a little symbol, you know, probably about, I don't know, five inches by five inches mm -hmm. um and it's it's kind of it's kind of masked within the floor like say if the floor was black the marker would be would be gray or yeah. say if the, the floor was purple the marker would be blue so it, it hides the to the audience eye but yeah i definitely i definitely overlay my floors with a grid when i whenever i can that's awesome um we have a, a couple of questions from aubrey here um is your process the same for fall or larger groups as it is in winter or spring um, I'd say in, I mean, in some regards, I'm, I'm, I don't know, sometimes this sounds a little bit, uh, um, like self-referential, but at the, at the end of the day, like I'm me. And so I can only write me stuff, Right. but I, I would say, no, they're not the same process. Um, I always start with motion. Like we talked about before, sometimes I don't care about the picture as much as I do about the motion. Mm -hmm. And that's exacerbated on the indoor scene because of the medium and how close you are. You don't see, like if you go to a halt, you don't see the picture really as much. I mean, like uh, on, in the fall, there's so many more people and so many more options for what picture you could be making that it becomes a whole other level to the palette. But um, I'd say at the end of the day, um, I go about them pretty differently. Yeah. Um, we have a message from Julian here. Do you end up writing out a count sheet beforehand and placing markers or do you just end up doing it as you go? No, I always do a count sheet beforehand. The count sheet is the Bible for a lot of the things. Um, sometimes I'll make it, sometimes someone else will make it, either the program coordinator or someone else. Um, but a lot of times I'll, I'll do it and I'll have a column for, you know, what's the overall effect here? Oh, well, you know, they'll start small, like what's the count structure? Uh, what's the measure numbers and then we'll go to to bigger picture like what's the general effect moment here and then everyone like say the the band director the drum instructor the garden instructor will have their little column to add things like okay here we have a trumpet solo or here we have eight rifles and 16 flags or whatever the thing is that they think i need to know so that before we even have a talk together there's a lot of information flowing between partners um and then that information for me the amount of information I have on these page tabs, like here, like this says hold, this has the measure numbers, it has the page tab, this, this is letter D in the music. It says introduce new snare character, which is these bad boys right here. Um, that's all a super truncated version of the count sheet that existed prior to this. Right. It's the reference that you need immediately on hand. It's, yeah, my reference versus the count sheet for everyone is for everyone. 
Understood. Um, Austin asks, how do you go about setting up an initial file? Is there a workflow yeah. or are there settings you really find helpful before you start pushing dots? Yeah, so I mean, let's just start one. Cool. So um, obviously, this is a continuation file, so it, it makes the same uh, floor structure or the 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 overlay, and everything stays the same and the same amount of people. But what um, let's say I, I, I yeah, let's start a brand new one. New file, new drill. There it is. There we go. So here we are. We're on a um, a brand new sheet. I like to just start with a page zero. And honestly, I like to do this because I will forget way too late on later on if I don't do this now. Right. Save right now. Ah, first thing, lay it out. Um, and then I actually like to set my page starting to zero. I'm sure there's a million ways to do that, but I just do. Um, okay, sometimes this takes me a while because I don't know what actual thing. I just push Control I, so I have to think what this is. File. All right. right. Yeah. Print print coordinates. Yeah. So print coordinates is Control I. Sometimes I forget what the actual terms are because I'm just like, oh, just hit Control Four. Um, but yeah. So I like to just set my page tab at zero. I know everyone has their their different thing. And then what I'll do is I will go and start with my count sheet. So my count sheet starts, and I will start by adding my page tabs. Keep window open, add page tabs, 16, 16, 16, 16. We're doing a college marching band show right now. And then with the whole 32 at the end. Cool. And then we'll just add, this is a hold, like we talked about. So we'll make it red. This is a trumpet feature. So we'll make it blue. And I will do all this stuff first. Measure numbers go in. Um, title I use for, like, say this is letter A or letter B of the music, all those things. So before I write a single page or even input members, um, these are the things I do. I set up a file like that. And then speaking of adding members, I'm sure this is not like a, a this is not a, like a thing that I'm, I'm not the only one who does this. So I will sometimes write, you know, starting here at the whole. Mm -hmm. What's the first impact I want? And then we'll write backwards. And maybe then I'll write who plays what instrument. Or maybe I won't even write who plays what instrument until like, you know, way down here at page 12 or something. Um, so the the actual drill writing section doesn't happen for me until uh, a lot later on into the file setup process. Nice. Actually, I usually, I usually segment those into different parts of my day or different parts of my week. Because it's really hard sometimes, at least for me, to do what that was was almost like a, a remedial task, like a, a very like repetitive, I've done this a million times type task. Whereas writing the drill should or you know often does feel different for every single group. You know, no one has the same amount of trumpets and clarinets and plays the same music. Um, so that part of the process feels very different. So, you know, even if it's before lunch or after lunch, but doing the kind of like quote unquote, busy work type stuff, and then segmenting later on into the more creative type stuff mm -hmm. is really important for me and my process. Awesome. Um, we have Jeremy asking, what spacing do you typically use with your snare line during fall while marching and tenor spacing? Um, I will default to two steps with the snares, three steps with the tenors, three steps with the bass drums. But if, say, there's two snares and two tenors, or you know, three snares and one tenor, I might as well just put them threes all the way across. So if the drum line is on the smaller side, or the snares and tenors are you know, less than like maybe four or five people, we'll just default to threes all the way across. Um, and then you know, never more than threes for a snare line, and never more than fours for a bass or tenor line, you know, in general. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, last, last night, I, or last night, last year, I broke pretty much every single drumline related staging rule with the Blue Knights, but other than that. <laughs> hey, you got to do what you got to do, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Amy asks, on the indoor show, uh, what size grid were you using? 
And do you use uh, the same size grid for all your groups, or is it based on what? So this is a five foot by five foot, and <laughs> unbeknownst to me, but I guess last year I wrote it with an eight to, with I put the same group with a different grid. Mm -hmm. um, so I sent out the first. I I don't know why how this happened, but I sent out the first chunk of show, and um, Sean calls me up and he goes, "Hey man, um, what the heck?" <laughs> and I I was like. <laughs> Sorry, my bad, dude. I thought the whole world was on five foot by five foot grids, but I guess that's just me. So moral of the story is I use five foot by five foot grids. All right. Do you use the same um, size grid for everyone or is it individualized for their tarp or? Individualized for the tarp, for sure. Um, and that has a lot to do, some, or sometimes that is completely decided before I even start writing. You know, maybe it's last year's floor that they've painted on the other side. Or maybe it's that this gym that they have a or they have a practice facility that's only this big and a gym that's only that big. So a lot of those things are decided by things other than my creative wants and needs. But um, I think this one is just a 50 by 80. Okay. Yeah, it's a 50 by 80 here. Okay. For uh, we have Scott asking, um, do you print out coordinate sheets for indoor, or uh, do members write their dots out from charts? Um, I highly prefer to not use coordinates after the first day of learning. Um, I like to use the coordinates because it's one single printout and we can learn really quickly. But part of the coordinates for me are part of a, are part of the learning process. So with the high schools that I teach, say we get the coordinates and we're only going to learn five or 10 pages today. By the end of the day, that coordinate sheet that you got, that everyone got passed out, should be in the trash can. And everyone's information should be in a dot book that's individualized to them with all the information that they need. Um, because maybe that coordinate sheet has a subset on count eight for just the flutes, and then a subset on count 16 for just the flutes and clarinets, but everyone else has a 24 count move. I don't want excess information, and I want space to be able to write, okay, we have a horn snap on five, or a plie on seven. I want lots of individualized individualization for the dot book that uh, the coordinate sheet can't allow for. So the coordinate sheet is a learning tool rather than a memorization or a rehearsal technique tool. Got it. Um, let's see here. We have questions. Can you let's see? Can you walk through adding page tabs once more? Sure. Let's go to the end of this file. This is so we can either do unlock here, mm -hmm. which is how he he describes that he does it from the bottom. Yeah, so you can unclick here and then just set your page tabs, and it tells you right over here. I almost pointed with my regular finger yeah. and then realized you guys can't see that uh, how far that is. So like, say I'm going down, uh, that's six. That's not quite eight. So I just drag it over for that. That's one way. The other way is to click Alt Tab or Alt Left Click, and that adds. Um, but then I just messed it up, right? I made that one a nine one, so it doesn't matter anyway. I need to go back and then do it. You can control, My favorite. You can control alt click to delete when your when your thing is closed too. Control alt click delete. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite way is to do the page tab or the the um, count the production sheet. Add page tab. I keep window open if you're gonna add more, and then that way every single time you know whether it's a seventeen count phrase. Or I don't have the space on this pro on this file but whatever the the phrase is i can be very specific with it and i've gotten to the point where it's just you know i'm i've got a little you know my little number pad and to, to click to, to click to, to click and it's just it's just very fast for me at this point so that's my favorite way of doing it but all three of those are are ways you can great um michael asks uh why a five by five grid versus a eight and a half or eight Eight to five, so um, the eight and a half to five for me feels small in the indoor medium. Mm -hmm. Like if I was to ask you just to take, you know, eight steps straight across the floor at eight to five, um, in general, that feels a little small. Um, and I, I have to be honest, you know, like I, I'm a Southern California boy. So uh, sometimes our perception of indoor drumline is, is different from other parts of the country. And I know just like you know, people from Indiana or Ohio, their perception of indoor drumline is different as well. I mean, that's that's a obviously, you know, you could say the same thing about Texas marching band or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, 
And some of it is, you know, I learned on a five foot grid. So I like how it looks when snares are at one and a half. So what would that be? Seven and a half feet apart. Um, I like how that looks, or I know that I know in my head what a two grid apart looks like, or it's just, for me, it's a lot of familiarity. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that's important for me. Um, I've honestly been a little intrigued by the six to five or six foot grid, just because I think, you know, what would it look like if I had two snares on, on intervals that were six feet apart instead of like one and a half at seven and a half at 7.5 or ones at five foot. So I'm intrigued by the idea. Right. But at this point, I don't really know how many times I, I'm going to be given the leeway to just say, hey, I'm experimenting here. We're, we're going to try an entirely new grid system. Today. Yeah. I have done the 8 to 5 grid, and I can tell you I, I actively dislike that one for me personally. Let me see. And uh, we answered this question, but he, uh, it was also asked, you, you do dot books for indoors. I but do you, not. You do not. Do you have them, what do you have them write in? Um, I've, I've been okay with cell phones with my indoor kids before because it's a smaller group and, uh, sometimes a little bit, uh, there's less distractions and things like that versus like if I'm teaching a 150 person band, cell phones might not be my first choice. Right. So in, indoors, I'm okay with, with cell phones. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I, if I'm writing drill in person, like not like this that I, that I just showed you guys, right. if I'm writing drill in person, it, I, it could change from one hour to the next. So yeah. we're very fluid and a lot of it should be just memorized yeah. um, with my groups I do in person. I don't know exactly how um, these guys learned it, but I gave them all the tools that, that Pyro allows me to. You know, we have coordinate sheets, we have charts, we have all that stuff, but I think they were mostly learning through charts because in my opinion, that's probably the best way to do it, to understand that like, hey, look, these are cover downs. Like, yeah, the audience isn't really gonna see cover downs here. They're gonna see these diags. But mm -hmm. for you as the performer, you're seeing cover downs and you're seeing these up the angle diags. Those are probably two things you would you would note as a performer. Like if I was this tenor drummer, or sorry, if I was the cymbal player, I would mm -hmm. say cover down on ten, tenor drummer and get in diag. Those would yeah. be my two. Your two key points. Yeah. So I think learning through coordinates is a little. It's a time saving device for a big for a bigger group like a marching band, right. but for a smaller group like an indoor drum line, it might be better just to learn through the, the actual charts themselves. Right. Looks like uh, Steven says that they did learn from the charts. So. Hey, Steven. Good, I'm glad. Um, Jay asks, uh, he wants to know why you're intrigued by the six foot grid. He wants you to explain more. And hi, James. Hi. <laughs> um, well, let's say I want to put the snares at one grid apart. Five feet feels really small to me um, from an indoor setting. I want, I tend to go at 1.5s on the five foot grid. So that means seven and a half feet apart, but I'm intrigued by what was, what would a six foot grid do to my perception of that? Would uh, I know, um, you know, one grid would be a six foot distance, but then uh, two would be a nine foot distance. And that's pretty huge. Nine feet is a pretty substantial, um, like at one and a half of those is a pretty substantial distance. So. I just, I don't know. I'm just like, I, I wonder what it would feel like <laughs> right. to, if to write a little too small, the six foot, yeah. maybe just what you're looking for. Yeah. What would it feel like? What would it feel like if I wrote a really condensed grid at like half each, you know, or like 0.75s each of the six foot grid versus like ones each at a five foot grid. I'm, I'm just intrigued by the, the, the small minutia and changes between the numbers when you start dividing. That's an interesting idea to me. Right. Uh, do we have any other questions for indoor items? Uh, if not, I think we're going to move to a couple of his uh, outdoor groups to kind of explain how his thought process is for war riding for marching bands. I think we may be ready to move to Sweet. one of your other groups. Um, let's just, for S's and G's, go to... Uh, we have a question from Jackson. Did you ever march indoor? I did not march indoor, actually. You did not march indoor. Nope. Where did you march? Uh, I marched, uh, well, I went to Vista Murrieta High School um, in Murrieta, California, Southern California. Um, and then I marched Pacific Crest while I was still in high school. And then as soon as I graduated high school, I started marching the, the Blue Devils. I did that for four years. 
Awesome. So yeah, I did two years at Pacific Crest and four years at Blue Devils. Wonderful. Yeah, so this is uh, the Blue Knights from last year. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this is honestly, sometimes when I get to things that are a little more, um, I don't want to say, let's say like prestigious, but like more more widely seen, the, the charts mean less and less sometimes because, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm inputting this on the field sometimes. So if... I want to adjust things. Sometimes I can just do that on the fly. And especially with Blue Knights, we have a really strong membership. So it's a we have the ability to go like, hey, you've won. Instead of me, like, oh, good thing we're, we're saving here. Don't want to lose this. Don't want to, we don't want to lose this this really good drill that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> hey, hey, you've won. Just go over this way a little bit. Cool. Now everyone adjusts the spacing and they can do that by themselves versus me grabbing this. And adjusting the spaces you know right and then having to reprint and you know on tour getting something reprinted is well we do we, i mean we have a pretty pretty good system set up for getting stuff reprinted but it'd be so much easier if i could just tell okay you've won go to three off the 45 everyone else adjust your spacing so there's a lot of things in this that didn't turn out exactly like they are on my power chart right. um because of things like that um are y'all still using uh with blue knights physical printouts are you using any of the the app options at all or we have not used the app options we've done the physical so far great um zach asks uh do you recommend alienware over everything else or would you choose something else or is there brand I, loyalty or i really like my alienware i have no brand loyalty to it i do need a pc just because i've run pyware on max before and i don't i don't enjoy the process also, um, I play video games on my computer, so I can't have a Mac. <laughs> no. um, but I like I like MSI as well. MSI have really again too big to travel with, but it's what it, it is. What it is, you need something strong to do the level of computing that you're doing on Pyware, especially now that you know we have so much. Oh, that's good. Especially now that we have so much like you know visual component to the real view software. Right. Um, you need something a little beefier, and so I I like Alienware and I like MSI. Great. Thank you. Um, is there anything that you apply to your outdoor shows that you use in your indoor shows? Yeah, I'm trying to more and more, honestly. When I was saying earlier that I start with motion, I think my marching band drill has gotten more and more like that over time. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So like, even like even like this, like this, this thing here is a whole lot of nothing in Pyware. Right. But in the real world, this was a whole phrase that took on a life of its own. Like right now, we're just watching it chug a choo choo its way along, a whole lot of nothing. But this phrase, yeah, like they don't even they don't even line up. It's not correct. Like, but I know that I have a staff at the Blue Knights who can implement this. They can see the things that I have in my head, and like I said, we you know we'll talk on the phone or talk in person, mm -hmm. um, you know, and and we'll be able to implement this over time. And a drum corps season, again, is a little different from a marching band season because of the length and longevity of, of time that you have to change and manipulate your show. But right. this was a, a really big part of the show that it just never quite came together until the last, let's say, week and a half or two weeks of the season. Like, oh, finally, we got that, we got that idea that really it, started it to come evolving. together. Right. Yeah, it kept evolving over time. But, you know, this is... This whole the, the, this whole section here is some of the more like I mean this this movement that I opened up is some of the more like you can't see my air quotes drilly stuff that I think I wrote for the Blue Knights this past year, um, but there are moments within it where I just tell my 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 staff like hey do your thing be awesome and then they go and be awesome. Great. Uh, we have a question from Jamie. How far do you get into band body ideas when you're writing drill? um it depends on like the capacity and the, that i'm teaching the group within if i'm also writing the choreography which i do for high school bands um i will maybe write like a little placeholder just like a little plie kind of like a marker for me to remind myself that this is where i want to add additional choreography and then i'll send a choreography video for the kids to learn um but if i'm writing it for a group where i don't know their visual caption head i don't know what level of choreography they have or not i will just add something you know whether it's a lunge or a plie on the hits that i think should exist 
right. well, there's a bass drum and gong on count five. We should definitely do something there. And if it's just, you know, if they watch a the thing and they see a plie and they like the plie, then then cool. But if they want to add like a four starch with a tilt, like go for that too. That's, right. that's, that's, you know, that's your band. But um, I would say I, you know, uh, judging by the average of the videos I see on the Pyro user group, I probably add visuals less than most people. You just use them as uh, kind of reference markers. They're more like bookmarks than anything for me. Right. Understood. That's great. Let's see. How much do you animate those visuals on Pyware? Uh, essentially none. Essentially none. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Very, very little. Um, have you received uh, any requests to do that or no? I haven't. Um... But I think the reason I haven't yet is because I do offer choreography as one of my services. So if a band wants my input on choreography, they can just get my input on choreography. Right. And I, I will send like, you know, unlisted YouTube videos, videos or whatever it is that we decide on. So um, adding it in Pyware, it just, it seems like it's, it's I, something I could do with my actual physical body. Right. It's where you would send the, you would send an actual video. Yeah. It's more descriptive for what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And Jeremy asks, is there an easier way to add a ripple visual than adding it count by count on the track? So for rippled visuals, what you'll do is you'll need to spread your anchors over the range. I did a specific video on this last week um, where you select the performer, a single performer, and then you would apply the visuals over the count ranges you want. Uh, let's say we broke it down for about 16 counts. You're going to create a four count transition. You move your anchors, four counts, create your visuals change, and then move your counts for the next uh, visual change. You keep doing that, and then you're able to copy that visual range and paste it to a list of, or a range of performers. And then you can do that um, uh, sequenced by one count or two counts. Uh, and that is under the edit menu for paste visuals. Yeah, so right here I'm doing, I chose this tube up here. Mm -hmm. I wrote lean left, take one count, and then I could take all of these guys and I can, oops, I have to copy this custom. Yeah, copy, copy control C, in case, you, yeah, I did control C there, and then um, paste visuals. And then you can, oops. There you go. You'll see that you have it at the paste visuals and then sequence every, I kind of sequence it, I can sequence it every one count instead. And it'll go in the direction of my pasting. So from green to red. And so I didn't have enough counts on this, but yeah, so the, these guys are lunging. Lunge, 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 lunge. And then I ran out of counts because it's only a six count phrase. Right. But and you're, yeah, you're so you go to with uh, you can actually create a range of visuals and copy that range of visuals as well. Yeah. Yeah, especially yeah, if you do multiple things with each performer, they can all do the same thing but in a rippled fashion just from doing that paste. Mm -hmm. That's been that's been pretty helpful for me on um more like more like things like step offs like uh like this tool here. Right. The stagger tool has been huge for me. It is kind of magical. <laughs> All right, we have a question from Craig. Uh, is creating a wave through a large group the same or similar? How do yeah. you create a wave? I, I'm guessing by wave, we mean just like a, a ripple lunge or something like that. Right. Or, or a movement or something like that. Oh, Craig, yeah. are you wanting a visual or an actual movement change? Visual is, visual is done through the same exact way, the copy and paste yep. of the visual itself. Basically, Next. you would just create the uh, the lunge or, uh, James, if you'd like to explain as well. Yeah, I just find that the bigger the group is, honestly, the more the stagger tool and the copy and paste tool really help me. Um, let's do this, let's just go. We can take these guys and then give them the same matching they had before. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I can't. And then we'll just delete and have them stand still. Um, but yeah, now we have 12 counts, which is a little bit better. And then we'll take this guy and we'll give him one of those visuals again, right? We'll give him uh, a kneel both knees because that's more impactful. 
just a one count. And then again, we copy, we copy this one, control C, select everyone now, everyone we want to do that visual. Then we paste visual, sequence every one count. We can even sequence in reverse order so it goes the opposite direction. Oops, let me open this guy now. Oh, there goes my. So see how they're going from the opposite direction now? Mm -hmm. So they're working from this side too, because I put sequence from in reverse order. So you can do that, and then you can just copy. You can take this grouping and do the same thing. You can paste visuals again, and you just do that for every grouping that you have, and you can have the entire ensemble done pretty darn quick. Right, and then you get a, a wave visual effect. And then if you're wanting to do that with an actual creation of a maneuver, you yeah. use a dagger tool. Yeah, if I wanted to change, um, if I wanted to change this grouping, like to say to move it over or something like that, we can just push it over. Oh. And just push everyone over, and then we would take this tool, step off every one count and then we would be able to layer that step off i know this is look, looks confusing because they're on top of each other but they're layering their step off from there yeah, there we go and uh bobby is asking how do you approach your opening set we kind of went over how you uh set up everything beforehand but how do you actually go about putting the dots on the page for the first time. Uh, let's do that. Cool. So again, I have to add a page. And then switch this to zero because that's just the way I work. Mm -hmm. And um, let's just say it at pay at the count 64, this is a 16 count hold with everybody. And more often than not, I would say I write the impact first. More often than not, I, I say I think I would start with this rather than starting here. Um, so what I would do is I would take my our made up group of 64 people. Eight positions there, eight positions there, 64 people. And I would take this block here, and I would make it exactly what I want. And we'll take that 8 by 8, so we have good math. And oh, we don't have good math, we have bad math. <laughs> and we'll change the 4s to 8s and 3s. Get that on the page. Sweet. So it's a disaster right now, right? If I was to write this drill set, mm -hmm. it's a disaster. It's a very pretty disaster, but it's a disaster. <laughs> so I'm going to take this. I'm going to start write, writing in reverse. So this is a hold, which means we'll just delete. We'll make it a hold. So this 16 or this 16 counts is already a hold. Now we have to figure out what this 64 counts is. And why not? Let's just delete that as well. And let's just make it a big old expansion. In 64 counts, we're just going to take over the whole field. Or we're going to go from taking over the whole field to condensing down to that block. So we've got this nice and open. Again, not the greatest math, but I would fix that in real time if I could. And then that condenses pretty evenly mathematically. So. Again, the opening set, the, kind of the point of all this is the opening set was a byproduct of what the impact set was. Mm -hmm. If I don't have an idea for, like, say, a, a piece of choreography or a visual effect at the opening, which, you know, very well may be the, the thing, maybe there's like a stage and we need to introduce a character or something like that, that, that could be a way to start the show. But if I'm, if I'm thinking from a drill perspective and not from an effect or a choreographical perspective, I almost start, always start with this impact and then, you know, once we're at this impact, then we know like these six people are flutes, and then these 10 people are clarinets or whatever. We can work and mark that later. But you have to start on the first page to enter your people, no matter what. Like I can't go here and enter new people. 
I have to enter people from uh, set zero. And then from there, I write that impact and then click the little flippy button. And now I'm writing backwards, like we just saw. I hope that it answers your question. Yeah. Well, can I blow your mind just a little bit real quick? Yeah. Go ahead and delete those performers that you just added. And I want you to alt click on your red page tab. Yeah. I want you to now draw your block. Sweet. So if my red and yellow are together, I can add new people no matter what. Correct. Now, if you spread your anchors there and turn them backwards, you can now move in and start writing. Sweet. And then, yeah, so this would be a hold. And then here would be, oh, OK, cool. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> See, we're all learning something today, guys. Let's all hold Might hands. Might save you a couple of steps. And you never know, that saves a lot of time in the long run. This is bothering me that we're not at good intervals. <laughs> Ta-da, all better. Wonderful. Cool. Yeah. So I guess that's how um, you add more in the middle. Another question I have is when do you normally label your performers? Um, as late as I feel comfortable. I like to push it off as far as I can. Um, especially if the opening if the opening doesn't require like in, that nobody's playing, maybe it's a soloist or maybe it's a, a front ensemble with a guard uh, feature or something like that until the whole band comes in together, like then I can, I can push it off even after the first impact if I can. Um, if the idea requires obviously that the brass is on side one and the woodwinds are on side two or whatever, then I'll need to pare that down a little bit more from there. But as far into the show as I can push it, where the instrumentation isn't becoming a factor in in what kind of creative things I'm making, the better for me. Great. I know that's a it it's up in the air for a lot of people. Um, Jackson asks, do you collaborate with the arranger and the band director when you get, stage the instruments? Um, it depends. Sometimes you know the band director just wants to hand over everything to you, and that's totally fine because you know. I'm not a band director, they're not a drill writer, but sometimes, you know, the band director says, okay, well, I know our trumpet section is strong and I know our alto saxophone section is weak, so let's make sure this happens or that happens. So there is a lot of, like, variance between, you know, what a, what a, what the band director is looking for and what the band director is wanting. Um, the arrangers, if I'm doing a show from scratch, like it's not a box show or a pre-written, not even a box show, but a pre-written show, um, if I'm doing a show from scratch, then almost always I'll have some conversations with the arranger about, you know, what was your intent here? What were you seeing? Should this be together? Should this be spread? You know, things like that. Great. Were there any other questions for James while we have him? Anything else that you'd like to see or any, any other uh, questions on how he does things? Um, we've got a question from Joseph. Uh, how much info do you need or do you or take from guard designers? Do you have concepts you imply? Um, well, as much as the guard person wants to give me, I am totally all ears for it. Um, it's the last thing I think a lot of us, who, at least people like me who was were a brass player or a wind player or maybe even a drummer, guard is always the thing where I feel like I need the most input because well a it's the thing i did the least i have not done any color guard i've i've never thrown something in the air and then caught it um but b like there's just so much variance and i'm talking about variance there's so much variance in what is acceptable or wanted from one guard designer to the next so they're very different people um and and you can tell them i said that <laughs> <laughs> um we have a question from david how many schools do you write for in the fall i try and keep it at 10. A 10? Yeah. And Jay wants to see a ripple barrel roll. <laughs> um, you want me to do a barrel roll, and then you can do the barrel roll. Uh, no, I make my bed every single day. 
Uh, Bobby asked, can you, uh, yeah. or, can you show us your, or tell us your favorite drill sequence on Pyware from Blue Knights 19? Um, yeah, let's do it. I wonder, um, we should make Austin write his guess and then he pays me if he's wrong. <laughs> All right, Austin, put it down. It's it's the part where we play loud. <laughs> the part where we play loud. Not this part where we play loud. I do like this form over here though. Um, yeah, it's after this play loud. Again, note the drum lines in the front because I'm a bad drum line stager. No, Mike Mike Jackson said I could do that, which means it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I liked this one. There's just some things in here that I did. And speaking of like you know, some of the winter stuff. There's a couple of things that I, I was able to do in here that I kind of liked. Mm -hmm. Let's see. If you'll share that with us. And... and we have, a, while, we're work, while you're working on that, uh, Jamie asked, how did you decide on the three circles for your props last year? Um, it was Jay Murphy's idea. <laughs> Jay Murphy. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, sorry, you want me to answer the next question? You want to show oh, that? I wanted to see the, the uh, go ahead and, that was the next question. If you okay. go ahead and show the page if you've got it. Cool. Sweet. Okay. Um, yeah, this is one of those ones where uh, it looks easier than it is. And I'm sure any of the Blue Knights kids who are on here could tell you. Yep, and that was it. Awesome. Uh, we have a question from Jeremy. When implementing jazz running, non-playing, what is the uh, max real? Pardon me, max realistic achievable step size? Um, depends on the group I'm writing for. I don't write a. I, I try not to write a jazz run if I don't. If it's not maybe like a one or two members or something like that, unless I've specifically talked with the director or the visual captioner that they're comfortable with it. Um, a drum, a drum core is obviously different where I don't concern myself as much with the physical capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm super, I try to be hyper aware of the step sizes and which direction they're going to and coming from um, when I'm writing for high schools, especially ones that I've never worked with before. Uh, four to five, it would be as big as I would ever write for a high school band. Right. Were there what's any gonna, other questions for a- uh, What's it gonna take to get Jay Murphy on Pyware? Um, an act of God. <laughs> Come on, Jay. <laughs> That's funny. A paper napkin feature. <laughs> All right. Well, James, thank you so much for coming on with us tonight. Of course. Appreciate it. It's been uh, very informative. Um, Sweet. Well, thanks so much for having me. Yes, sir. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be doing night school. I'm going to be touching over the entire virtual clinic um, so we can use that for our uh, drill design challenge that's going on right now. So thank you again, James. And everyone, yeah. you all have a great night, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Take care.